join me this morning as we start off in the book of Mark in chapter 16. Mark in chapter 16, we will read the first eight verses. Mark in chapter 16, we will read the first eight verses. And if you will, stand up and join me as we read the word together in celebration. In respect and honor to the word. Let's read the first eight verses of Mark chapter 16. And read it along with me. Let's go. One, two, go. Now, when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Salome, brought spices that they might come to anoint him. Very early in the morning, on the first day of the week, they came to the tomb when the sun had risen. And they said among themselves, Who will roll away the stone from the door of the tomb for us? But when they looked up, they saw that the stone had been rolled away, for it was very large. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man, clothed in a long white robe, sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go and tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you into Galilee. And there you will see him as he said to you. Last verse. And so they went out quickly and fled from the tomb. For they trembled and were amazed. And they said nothing to anyone. For they were afraid. This morning I want to talk about, for a few minutes, an early morning surprise. Tell your neighbor, God will give you an early morning surprise. Tell the other person, God will give you an early morning surprise. Father, we thank you this morning for the entrance of your word. It brings light and it brings understanding. Thank you for this day of atonement, the day of resurrection that we are celebrating here together. Speak your word once again to us and grant that we may have life everlasting in you. Through Christ our Lord we have prayed. Amen. Amen. Go ahead and take your seat. An early morning surprise. That's my prayer for every one of you. A good early morning surprise. You see, yesterday I was visited by a young family who had young children. And when they were leaving, they had a box of chocolates that they were taking away with them. And I was musing in my head that life is almost like a box of chocolates. You get that box of chocolates, it has different flavors, different nuts, different things inside it. But when you go in to take one, you never quite know what you're going to pull out. The best part of it is that it could be Milk chocolate, it could be dark chocolate, it could be filled with different things, but until you pop it in your mouth, you don't know what it is that you are going to get. And decorum does not allow you, now that you have popped the chocolate in your mouth, to put it back inside the box. You can't do that. So you're going to have to swallow it and finish it regardless of what it is. Life is sometimes like that because it deals you surprises. That when you pull something out of the box, it is never often what you like or what you want or what you would desire. But now that you got it, you just have to deal with it. This is a truth also about faith and walking with Jesus Christ. No matter how big your Bible is, no matter how many times you come to church, no matter how many ministries that you serve in, no matter how much money you give, no matter how much you pray, none of that 
can ever put you out of the way or predict what God is going to do or how he's going to respond or what things you will get in him. I've said this time and again. God is reliable, but he's not predictable. What do I mean by that? You never know how God is going to answer or when he's going to answer, but absolutely God is reliable. God has a way oftentimes of delivering to you a box filled with different type of things that may be unpleasant. You see, when you look at the story of the young women that we looked at, in the box they pulled out were unpleasant surprises. And what am I talking about? The diagnosis, sometimes many get a diagnosis of cancer. You hear that your mom, after being ill, you thought she was going to get well. But she, she passed away. You've gone to the hospital a few times and they've told you there's nothing wrong with you. Just hold on, it will soon be your turn. You've taken an exam many times and simply did not pass, even though you know the subject. You go through life and many times you get unpleasant surprises. Sometimes you feel abandoned by family members. You feel left alone by people who should have got your back, who swore that they were going to get your back. The good news that I have for you today is that Easter is a reminder that no matter what disappointments life has given to you, no matter how bad the situation can be or has become, no matter how long you have been in the circumstance that you are, God still has a way that he can blow your mind. And he can blow your mind in a good way. And I'm praying for you today that God will blow your mind pleasantly. Yeah. Tap your neighbor and tell him God will blow your mind. God is full of beautiful surprises. And that's what the story that we find these women encountered that morning is. Let me give you a little bit of a background to it. So that you can understand with me what was going on. Everything that those women pulled out of the box for the last 36 hours were unpleasant surprises. They never imagined that Jesus Christ was going to get arrested. But he did. They never imagined that he was going to be whipped and beaten so badly, but he was. They never imagined that they would nail him on the cross, helpless, but he was. They never imagined that he would die like that, but he did. And now at the end of it all, they are now looking at themselves that this is not the way this was supposed to play out. This is not the way that the story was supposed to end. On Saturday, Sabbath, they went to church. They went to the temple. They praised. They prayed. But you know, sometimes you are in there, but your heart is not there. I remember some time ago, my wife and I went out. We had just received some disturbing news. And we went out, and it was time to worship and praise. We stood there together, side by side. We praised. We lifted up our hands, and we worshiped. And when it was over, we looked at ourselves. And she said to me, something I agreed. She said, I did that, but my heart was still heavy. I said, I hear you. There's someone who is here today who is going to be lifting up their hands and praising because the next person to them is praising. There's someone who is here today. You are in church because it is Easter Sunday, and that's what you are expected to do. Come to church. There's someone here today who has a heavy heart because of things that you expect God should do, should have done, should have been doing, but is still not there yet. And you are here this morning. You're supposed to be here happy for Easter, but then I want to tell you there is a God full of surprises that will blow your mind. Let me give you three surprises because of our time that these three women that they got that morning as they were going. The sisters, when church was over, they got up in the morning like you and I. Sabbath was over. The following morning, they came to church and they go to the tomb of Jesus expecting to encounter his body. Now, what did they find? The first surprise that they found was this. They got to the tomb as they were going along the way. The question 
that was on their minds was who will roll away the stone? After Jesus was laid in the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea, they took a large stone and they rolled it across to block anyone from getting there. They put the large stone along the way to block anyone in out and to block anyone out from going in. And the three women went to the tomb that morning. And as I was reading the story, one thing came to my mind. Where was Simon and John and James and all the other people who said they were? Why was it the women that got there first? How did they get there before all the other people? That they now had to be the ones to go. Why did they leave the women to go and do something that absolutely they had no power to do? Because we know any which way that they could not have rolled away this huge stone by themselves. A reality of life is that you may sometimes find yourself abandoned by folk who have always promised to have your back. You will get to a point where the people who said, I got you, and you will find out that you didn't get them. You were there when they needed you. You were there when they supported you. Now, you when you supported them, rather. But now that it's your turn, they're nowhere to be found. Has anybody been there like that? Have you been disappointed yet by people? The good news today is that God will blow your mind. You see, sometimes life will put you in situations that you have no control over. Those three women, when they were going to church that morning, or going to the tomb, rather, they knew having put together all their resources, all their relationships, all their resume put together, they know that it was not going to be enough to roll that stone. Have you been there before that you know that by yourself, nothing you have done or nothing you can do will have changed your situation? I wish that they were here to join me today and testify that God has done something that surprised me. I wish I could have a testimonial from anybody in the house today that can tell me that when you thought that you had nothing else to do, God showed up and surprised you. If there's anybody like that here today, stand up on your feet and give the Lord a big shout of praise. Yes. Go ahead. Because you know that when, when we serve a God, this is how God will surprise you. You wonder how he will handle the situation, but he just goes ahead and he surprises you. Let's put our hands together for the Lord this morning. <laughs> sit down, sit down. We serve a God that can move obstacles. The first thing, the first surprise that those ladies had that morning was that whatever obstacle it was that was in their way, God moved it away. Any obstacle that is in the path of your life, for what you have decided, for the assignment God has given you, I pray for you today, on this day of Easter, that the Almighty God himself will move it away in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Whenever you have your stone, a stone in your way, you need to look back and understand that God has moved stones before. He has removed obstacles before. He has removed things that could have been there in your way before. If he has done it before, I need you to remember that he will do it again. The way you know someone who truly believes that is by what you expect. Your expectations will drive the kind of things that you get. Look at Proverbs in 23 in verse 18. Proverbs in chapter 23 in verse 18. It says, surely there is an end. And the hope of the righteous, the expectations of the righteous will not be cut short. You have to be expectant. Tap someone to and tell them you have to expect something from God. You have to expect something from God. So God in surprising you will remove obstacles. The second surprise that they got that morning. The sisters were concerned not only about the stones, but they were also concerned about the soldiers. You see, in the gospel account, all four of the gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they each saw it from their perspective, and the detail of what they each reported was slightly different. 
Mark did not say anything about soldiers. But look at what happened in Matthew chapter 27 in verses 63 and 64. Matthew carefully tells us that after Jesus was buried, they put him in the tomb. They then told soldiers, fully armed soldiers, to go and stand in the way. Why? Read it with me in Matthew chapter 27, verses 63 and 64. Mark didn't say, but then these Jewish leaders who killed him, they went and they said to the king, and they said, Sir, we remember while he was alive, how this joker said, after three days, I will rise. Thereafter, therefore now, command that the tomb be made secure until the third day so he can claim to get up again. Lest his disciples come by at night and steal him away and say to the people, he has risen from the dead so that the last deception will be worse than the first. What they were saying in essence is, don't let them come and take him. Because if they take him, then they will claim that he rose. Meanwhile, it could simply be that they were hiding him. Listen, and I mean this respectfully. If I was Jesus, and thank God I'm not. <laughs> because on that morning when he got up, and they're wondering where he is, then nobody will wonder where I am. No. Where did he go? We don't know. They have to be sending people. I would get up and go look for all those people that said, I can't come up, I won't get up. Go look for them and knock on their door. And when they open the door, I'll just throw up juices on them and say, I'm here. And then leave again. Then I will go and look at all the other people that said, he, he's lying. I'll just go knock on their door and say, check this out. And then turn around again and go. But he didn't do that. He had to be sending messages to go and see. You see, the women, this is the second surprise that they had. They were not just worried about the obstacle of the stone. They were also worried about the opposition of the people. They were worried about opposition. You see, God can not only move obstacles, but he can also remove opposition. So, whatever is opposing you in your God-given dreams in this year, the Almighty God will remove it by himself in the name of Jesus Christ. You see, what happens is that opposition is never a thing. Opposition is always a person. And that is why when you read Zechariah in chapter 4 in verse 7, Zechariah in chapter 4 in verse 7, it talks about the mountain before Zerubbabel. Read this carefully with me. It said, who are you, O great mountain? Before Zerubbabel, you shall become a plain. And he will secure for the capstone with shouts of grace, grace. Read that first sentence again. And look at me if that syntax is correct. Say, who are you, great mountain? You do not refer to a speaker as a who. You do not refer to a table as a who. That's a what. You will say, what are thou, great mountain? Is that what you will say? But he said, who are thou, Zerubbabel, great mountain? Before anybody that is standing in your way, I pray with you today that God will remove them by himself. Yeah. We prayed a prayer on Friday where we said that God should remember every one of us. And we said, when God remembers you, he does many things. One of the things that God can do is that he said he would punish everyone who is standing in your way. And the prayer we prayed is, God, I don't know what you want to do with that person or that thing. If you want to kill them, kill them. If you want to keep them to see what I will become, leave them so that they can see what I will become. Afterwards, that is what David said in Psalm 23 in verse 5. He said, I prepare a table before you. In the presence of your enemies, I will anoint your head with oil and your cup 
will run over. So your enemies will see you. Tap your neighbor and tell them they can't do anything about your case. They cannot. They cannot. The surprise is that God can handle them. And God handles them in two ways. The first thing that God handled them was that he, captive, he captured them and he put fear into them. Why were they afraid? It's because they saw angels. The scripture tells us that they saw angels and because of the angels that they saw, they were afraid. Now, when you think about angels, you think about the cherubims and the seraphims, those ones that have a halo around their head that will strike fear in your heart when they're going. Those are not the ones I'm talking about. I'm talking about God sending you angels in the form of men. You know, sometimes they say that you, you host angels and you don't know. Sometimes a stranger will come into your life and do things for you that you have no idea who they are. And those must be the kind of angels that we're talking about. I remember the joke about the lady who was praying in her house and saying that um, she needed food, she needed help, she needed water, she needed resources. And her neighbor, who is an unbeliever, was laughing at her and saying, I want to see who will come and help you in this place. But he heard her crying every day, asking for help, asking for resources. So he went to the grocery store and bought supplies, bought food, bought water, bought drinks, left it on the door, and knocked on the woman's door. And the woman opened the door, and she saw the food there and said, thank you, Lord, for sending me all these things for me to use. And so the man opened it and said, it was not any God that sent it. It was me that put it there. The woman looked at him and said, God, thank you for using even the devil to bless me. <laughs> God can use any type of person to become an angel to bless you. And there are two ways he can do it. He can hold them captive. And the second reason why that was a surprise is that three of the gospel writers did not even mention the did not even mention the soldiers. Nothing was said about the soldiers when God decides that he wants to surprise you. Those people that are standing against you, they will not matter. You won't even remember them again. Go back and look at every time, every situation of toughness that you have been through. And you look back at what your enemy has said, what your opposition has done, or what they have said to you. You won't even remember their name. The soldiers were so insignificant, Mark didn't even remember them. Listen, let me tell you a story. You know, everybody has a beginning, and I have a beginning here too. When we got into this country, my family and I, I was not born here. But now, I'm here. I'm here to stay by the grace of God. We stood before an immigration judge, my wife and I. I had one child in my left hand, and she had the other child in her right hand. And we stood before the judge. The prosecution was telling the judge that you need to deport them and send them back to where they come from. The attorney who went with us that day had decided they were not coming because we didn't have money to pay them. We had maxed out on the credit card that we were using. True story. We had maxed out on the credit card that we were using. We called him in the morning and he said, I'm not coming unless, we pay, unless you pay. And so we went and we stood before the judge. And we truly looked at God and that day we said, it's now up to God. You see, when you get to that situation where it is up to God, then he will surprise you. The surprise for us that morning was that the judge began to tell us what to tell and respond to the prosecution. The prosecution was telling the judge, you cannot do that for them. The state counsel was saying, if you let them stay, they will run away. They are illegal. And the judge was telling her, they are not illegal again. He asked me, did you file taxes? I said, yes. And he began to ask me, what else do you do? I said, I serve in my local church. I serve in the assembly. I serve in everywhere. And the man said, okay, I will let them stay. You, prosecutor, tell me one reason why you think they should not be allowed to stay. And the guy kept quiet. And he said, okay, you guys can go. I'm telling you this to let you know that till today, I don't remember the name of the judge. I don't know who the prosecutor was. You see, when God decides to move in your life, 
everybody that is doing things around you, they will become insignificant. Tap your neighbor and tell them God will, God will silence them. The doctors, what the doctors said. There's a young lady here who they told could not have children. If I ask her what was the name of the doctor who said that then, I'm, I know that you will not remember the name of the doctor. If they ask you who was the name of the nurse who told you that it is too late, I know you won't remember their names. Because in Psalm 126, when you begin to read from verses 1, 2, and 3, the psalmist tells us, he said, when the Lord began again to turn around the captivity of Zion, he said, we were like them that were dreaming. And then our mouth will be filled with laughter and our voice with the sound of rejoicing. It takes people who are looking at you to let you know that God indeed has been faithful. Tap someone on the shoulder and tell them your God has been faithful. The third surprise that they had, and this morning I will stop here. The third surprise that they had was that when they were going to the tomb, they got there and the angel told them, you are looking for the living among the dead. He's no longer here. In my own translation, the angel just said to them, he's gone. He's gone. You can't find him here. When you look at what had happened, it looks like God has dis had discharged himself. You know how the medical profession, they call it AMA, against medical advice? The devil didn't want him to go. The soldiers were trying to keep him. The, the Jews were trying to keep him. Even his own people did not believe that he could get up. But he got up and he walked. He walked as he will walk into your life. The amazing thing about it was that there is no record that those women invited him along. There's no record that they prayed about what they were going to do. Nothing was said about him going there. You see, whether or not you invite God, he will be there for you. Where did he tell them to go? He said, he has gone to Galilee where he told them to go already. Where God is sending you, he's already waiting for you there. Where he was going and sent them to go was to Galilee. The place that God has sent you to, he's already waiting ahead of you. And that is the biggest surprise for you today. Is whether you invite him or yes, I pray he will gate crash your life. I pray he will force himself into your situation. I pray that he will take his pride of place even in your life in the name of Jesus Christ. You see, when you are going to gate crash a party, you must have confidence. You go to some parties, and you know many parties you go these days, they have a list, they have a name by the door, and they are looking at who can come in. How many of you have been to that kind of party? Yeah. And they have a name at the door, they have a list. But there are some of us, back in the day, when I wasn't always a Christian, and they would have parties, that like one club or the other having parties. And you walk up to the door, and when you show up at the door, you look at the man who is standing and trying to keep guard on the people. And you just look him in the eye and you talk to somebody else like, you, you, you can't be talking to me. I'm here. The swagger that you will get to, the security man that is standing by the door will look at you and say, this man, he must be here. And if they look on the list and your name is not there, with the confidence that you will show up, they will say, there must have been a mistake. That's why your name wasn't there. Has that happened to you before? Yeah, that's what happens. When Jesus Christ comes swagaliciously, that's my own creation, walking into your life, whatever it is that is along the way for you, God himself will show up for you. Amen. At the wedding in Cana of Galilee, they invited Jesus. And his mother came along with him. And he said to Mary, he said to the people there, he said, whatever he tells you to do, just do it. Because therein lies your surprise. So the way God will surprise you today, he will remove obstacles in your way. He will remove opposition from your life. And then he will come in and impose himself over circumstances and situations in your life. If you believe that, say amen. amen. What I want to leave with you is it's easier if you invite him. It's better if you invite him than if you wait until the end of the day. 
Because if you need to be forced, he will force you. I've, I've told the story of the young boy who was playing and his ball fell on the roof. And he did everything that he could, jumping to get the ball. He got a stool and was trying to knock the ball down. But all that happened was he fell down and he hurt himself. And then he turned around and turned to his dad, who was just sitting down there watching him all the time. He said, Daddy, my ball, my ball is on the roof. I need you to help me get my ball. And the dad turned to him and said, I've been here all the time. I was just waiting for you to ask me for help to get the ball. Too many of us spend all of our lives struggling about things that you cannot influence. We spend too much time struggling about things, complaining about things that you have no influence over. Today, I want you to invite Christ into your life so that he can be the one that will do and, and fight the battles for you. Do I hear amen? amen? There are some things you cannot influence. There are some things that will keep you up at night. Why do you need to be up at night when the scriptures tell us that he that keeps Israel, he neither slumbers nor sleeps. If the person who is going to fix it is not sleeping, why do you need to be awake? My wife preached a sermon to me a few days ago that she did not say a word. We were driving in traffic. We were going to a south suburb. There was traffic along the way. God knows I don't like to drive in traffic. But on that day, we were driving in traffic. It was raining. Visibility was bad. And as we were going on along, I was getting agitated. I was getting angry. And I was getting frustrated with the traffic. But there she was on her phone playing a game. And every time I looked at her, I got annoyed. I'm like, I'm going through all of this. And you're just going there, just playing your game. And she started humming under her breath. I mean, she was having a good time. Then I looked at her. And she looked back at me and says, what do you want me to do? You are driving. Whether I jump up and down with you or not, you will still drive. Whether I get upset with you or not, we will still go through the traffic. No matter what I say or do, you are still the one holding the steering wheel. God is holding the steering wheel of your life. Why are you bothering yourself? Why are you giving yourself heartache? Tap your neighbor and say, leave it to God. This morning on the day of resurrection, with all heads bowed, I want you to lift up your hands as I can go with you and say, unto Jesus, I surrender all the challenges. I give it to you this morning. Unto Jesus today, I leave all the struggles. If you are looking out over it, then I don't have no reason to worry about it. And that is why on this day of resurrection, the Lord will give you a good promise. He will give you a good surprise and fight your battles, remove obstacles, remove opposition, and insert himself into the place of control in your life. If there's anybody like that who wants to say today, I want to receive God, join me in one more second. Take a step of faith. Stand up on your feet. All eyes closed. Camera, don't turn to them. You want to say, this morning I welcome, on this day of resurrection, I make a bold declaration, whether you are inside or you are outside. I make a bold declaration, I want the almighty God to fight my battles for me. All eyes closed. I'm not trying to embarrass you. But all eyes closed, I just say, Father, if you are standing, pray, just pray this prayer along with me. This morning I receive you into my heart. I receive the Lord into my heart. With my heart, I believe. And with my mouth, I confess that Jesus indeed is Lord over all. I give my life to you. I give my heart to you. And I ask that you take pride of place in my life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.